it's another thing to go and experience it firsthand because you can draw on that emotion that you felt. You can recall it back and that allows you to get the energy needed to push forward through the hard part of your work. Welcome to another episode of the best real estate investing podcast here on the Jimmy Rex Show. And dude, today I'm with one of my close buddies, Mr. Dave Allred. He is the managing partner and founder of the Axia Fund, a real estate fund that uh, just started. And also, dude owns over a thousand doors in real estate. You're going to want to pay attention to this guy if you're thinking about investing in real estate. So, dude. Good to be here with you, man. Jimmy, so good to be on, man. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, that's, uh, I was thinking about how to intro you. We've known each other for so many years in so many different ways, but you've really, um, this is episode two. I've really tried to, I'm going to emphasize a lot more real estate investing. I, I kind of tested my audience to see what they wanted to know more about. And more than anything, people love when we talk real estate investing. And so I thought of you as somebody that's done this so well over the last couple of years, um, after the last 15, 20 years. And so first off, uh, how is it going with the fund? You started a fund, I guess, what, about six months ago? You guys kind of started putting it together, but you just launched maybe a month ago? Yeah, I'd say we started about a year ago, actually on the kind of behind the scenes, putting everything together on it. But we officially launched about a month, maybe a month and a half ago. It's been going awesome. It's called the Axia Fund and have some great partners on it. I'm really excited about it. We're actually in the middle of the capital raise right now. It's gone great. We're more than halfway fully subscribed on how, the fund. How big of a fund is it? It's a $20 million equity fund. So we'll have about 65 to $70 million of total assets under management with leverage. Okay. So essentially using the $20 million for down payments and things like that. You got it. Yep. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. And so why a fund? How did you get into the, why, why, why start for, for me? You know, I look at a fund and I think, man, there's just a lot of moving pieces. There are a lot of things that I don't know and understand. And so for me, I, I've been hesitant to go the fund route, but I just want to hear kind of what your thoughts were, why you decided to go that way. Yeah, that's a great question. So first off, I would say you're right. The fund is definitely a more complex real estate investment vehicle. There's a lot of complexity to it, a lot of, you know, SEC regulation, just a lot of a lot to it for sure. And so what led to it was I started out doing condos and townhomes maybe 15 years ago. And then I went into single family homes and then I went into fourplexes. I think I bought around 17 fourplexes. And then from there I went into large apartment complexes. From there I went into syndications. I've done over a dozen syndications. And then the natural progression from the next step was to go into the fund world. And so one of my guiding principles in my life is to always be doing a bigger deal or bigger deals than I did yesterday. There's always trying to up level and always trying to do something bigger because that's where the personal development comes from. And that's where I feel like I get stretched and I actually get the most fulfillment in my own life is when I'm doing bigger things than I did yesterday, right? So like, you know, Garmin has the tagline, beat yesterday. I, I love that. That's kind of how I live my life. But, um, you know, the main reason why the fund makes so much sense to me is I've always loved helping my friends come into real estate. You know, I've had hundreds of capital partners come into my syndications and different JV opportunities. But usually limited only maybe you know five to twenty investment partners in those syndications. With a fund, we're able to open it up to have hundreds of investors come in, and so it's able to we're able to create value for a lot more people in that fund model. Also, it's really the power of diversification. So for us, we're investing in RV parks, self storage, and mainly apartment complexes, and we're in basically ten different states. And so we're able to create real diversification by being in different asset types in different states. And so that helps with the, the risk profile of the fund. But the real beauty of the fund is compounded returns. And so as we dispose of an asset, it's, so it's all value add, if you guys know what that means. But, you know, so we acquire property, we add value to it, marketing, improvements, paint, whatever. And then we flip that, dispose of it, and then all those profits stay in the fund so we can go and acquire more and more real estate. Mm -hmm. And it's a five to seven year fund. And so we can actually turn our assets two to two, to two and a half times in that and compound those returns. So if somebody puts money in the fund, let's say they put, you know, whatever, $500,000 today into the $20 million fund. Do they get dividends on that or do they get that money at the end of the five to seven years or how does that work? That's a great question. So the way we structure this is we pay a 7% preferred return. So throughout the duration of the fund, you know, it's a five-year fund. We can go up to seven years based on if the economy is, you know, the housing market's in a tough spot. So from the entire duration, it's a 7% preferred return. And then at the, at the finality, as we unwind the fund, 
then we take you know the total lump sum of cash from disposing of the assets, pay back the, the bank debt, pay back every investor 100% of their principal investment, and that 7% prep rate if we ever miss a payment. And then whatever is left over is split either 70-30 or 80-20, depending if you're a class A or a class B investor. Got it. So the, you put enough money and you become a class A investor, is yeah. that correct? Yeah, so we, we kept the barrier, you know, the, the levels pretty low. So a class A investor is 150000 and then you get an 80, you get 80 percent of the, you know, the profits at the end. As a class B, it's a fifty thousand dollar investment, and you get a seventy percent split at the end. Gotcha. So, uh, uh, you know, a small amount difference at the end. But uh, besides that, everything else is the same. Seven percent prep rate is the same for class A, class B all along the way. But we really like that structure because, again, it mitigates risk. It allows more people into the fund, and we can really compound those returns. But also, as you know, Jimmy. You know, right now it's a really competitive real estate market, and so to go out and buy a multifamily asset, it's so competitive. It's it's really hard to win those 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 bids, right, between, between brokers, and so we can come into it fully funded. Where you know, with the syndication, I always had to go to capital calls my investors, and now we can come to the table saying we're already fully funded. We can close quickly, so that's also another competitive advantage of of the fund. Cool. So that was pretty high level talk as far as real estate investing goes. I want to back up to the beginning for a lot of my audience isn't necessarily as advanced in real estate investing. Tell us about like the first deal you ever did. How old were you? What did you buy? And we'll kind of back it back into your story here. So, so my first one was, it's actually a really funny story. So, you know, I worked with Vivint Smart Home and Vivint Solar for a 17 year career. And uh, my first year as a sales manager, I was able to make, you know, like $156,000. And up until that point in my life, I'd never really had money. You know, grew up in a very, very humble, you know, very, very poor, you know, household. What your, would your parents do? Uh, my mom was a stay-at-home uh, mom, and then my dad was a, uh, a, a, a supervisor at the Gunnison Correctional Facility, oh, so wow. prison guard. Yeah, you guys grew up pretty humble. Yep. How many kids? Yep. Four kids. Okay. Manti. I mean, I remember... We always, so we always went to Yellowstone for our family vacations, <laughs> and I never really knew why. I thought yeah. it was like we, we loved outdoors. <laughs> I thought we loved Yellowstone. I always joke around. And like You can tell in Utah what class you grew up in. If your family went like camping for your trips, you were probably pretty poor. If you went to Lake Powell, you were middle class. And if you went to Disneyland or Hawaii, you were upper class. That's so funny. That's so spot on, man. My first time going to Disneyland was actually, actually with my, my wife. and um, but Yeah, it was Yellowstone or uh, Zions Park every year. And um, we had like the, the, the annual pass, you know, to be able to go there. So, uh, but hey, you know what? At the time, I was grateful to oh, be that's awesome. grateful, yeah. right? That's the funny thing about it is like you don't, you don't know what you're missing out sometimes as a kid. But uh, anyway, so grew up like that. You know, we wanted to have a four wheeler in Manti. That was like the thing to do. Remember the four, my three siblings and I, we worked, you know, for about a year and a half to earn enough money to buy this used four wheeler. And then my brother uh, wrecked it a month and a half later after we just got the four wheeler, right? So, but anyway, just a lot of fun stories like that. And you know, I, I actually I'm actually grateful that we grew up in that environment because it just makes it more you appreciate things more, yeah, right? Same. Yeah. So, um, but moving into to real estate, so my first year as a sales manager, I made that kind of money. I was like, okay, hey, I need to figure out what to do with this. You know, my family never talked about finances. We never once had a conversation about how to invest or money management. You know, unfortunately, even in the school systems today. For some reason, it's kind of crazy to me. I won't get political on this, but I think it's on purpose. But uh, they don't really teach about finances. I, I, I say that too. It's on purpose. They purposely want people to be dumb about their own finances. The, the system doesn't work if people are saving their money and investing it, if nobody's wasting it on stupid things. That's right. Gets away from consumerism, right? Yep. And uh, independence and freedom. Yep. And so, anyway, so that first year, I was like, okay, I, I, I made some money. How do I you know, minimize my tax liability and how do I make this money actually count for me and, and, and whatnot. So I had no idea. Um, I asked my CPA, I said, hey, what are your wealthy clients doing with their money? And he said, every wealthy client's either doing real estate or owns business or doing both of those. And so I internalized that, okay, well, all right, that makes sense. So I want to jump in, I want to understand this real estate game. And so I remember making a commitment that I want to become a lifelong student of the game of money, mm. right? And I just really put myself in a situation to be coachable and to be like a sponge and really just soak it in. So I, I hired, you know, coaches, I mentors, I read every how, book, how podcast. Um, this was when I was 20, 22 years old. Okay. Yeah, I did the same thing. I had a lot of, at first it was audiobooks, a lot of CDs on tape and stuff like that. 
So my first investment property, though, this is a funny story. So I actually, I, before I had mentors and, and uh, you know, uh, masterminds and everything else, I, I, I bought the book, uh, How to Invest in Rental Properties for Dummies. <laughs> like literally like those black and yellow books, right? Yeah. And I read that whole book. I'm like, all right, I got this. Probably pretty good. <laughs> well, we finish the story, <laughs> and then we'll come back and see if that was a, <laughs> if that was a good book or not. That sounds um, good. Or maybe I didn't read it. Maybe I read it too fast. Maybe I didn't. I don't, I don't know. But... So I read the book and then I Googled real estate agents and I found one and uh, hired, you know, I didn't really ask any questions, just hired her. And she found me a fourplex in Midville, no, in Murray, 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 Utah. And uh, fourplex, cool, lined up with what I'd learned about real estate. I bought it and at the, t- at the closing company, I'll never forget this, we, I signed my name and then as I'm standing up, the real estate agent looks over and she goes, Dave, I just want to tell you, Thank you for uh, helping me close my first deal ever <laughs> with my new license. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is your first real estate deal transaction Amazing. on your end as well. And uh, so anyway, but then let's fast forward seven months later, and uh, I guess it was actually a, it actually was, was a duplex. It's zoned as a duplex. Oh, sure. but there's four families and there were two mother-in-law apartments down below. Yeah. And they got in a dispute, and so there's a noise complaint. So I got a, a letter from the city saying I needed to evict the two families in the you basement. Had no idea it was actually a duplex. No idea. Yeah, so yeah. went from a fourplex, four rooms didn't come down to two. Um, fast forward, you know, 08, 09 hit, sold it for a $60,000 loss. And so I literally learned like all the lessons. Yeah, you made all the mistakes. That's all, good. All of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny how many people get into that situation. They, because a lot of real estate agents don't even understand it. And I try to tell people, I was like, look, a duplex means it's legally zoned. You can rent both sides anytime you want. Uh, if it's a, a legal uh, accessory apartment, you have to live in one and you can rent out the other one to whoever you want. If it's a mother-in-law apartment, you have to be related to the person living in the basement. That's the three distinctions. But a lot of realtors don't understand that. So they'll sell stuff. I get calls all the time from people that need to sell a property because the city is you know, coming down on them because it was not zoned for what they thought it was. And most of the time they thought they were getting something that was legal a lot of those times, but yeah, I, I really wish I would have known flows. you. I wish I would have known you back then, man. <laughs> I wish I'd have known you back then. You bought a lot of real estate. <laughs> it was an e- easy sell for you right there. I think it was the only fourplex actually in the entire Salt Lake and Utah County market at the time because the market was like so hot back yeah, then, right? Yeah, sure. So, so anyway, so from that, so that was a learning lesson, but you know, I saw a lot of friends and a lot of people that were still really passionate about real estate. So luckily I stood, I stayed with it. So 2010, there are a lot of homes in, uh, coming out, out of the auction. Well, I want to stop you real quick because you kind of, so in 2010, you basically didn't own anything. Is that correct? 2009, nothing. Nine, ten. Yeah, yeah. Eight, so nine. I was the same way because I'd bought all these properties and I sold some, lost some on some, and everything else, made all the same mistakes. And uh, I didn't start rebuying my real estate portfolio till 2010. And uh, so it's just kind of ironic. It's we both kind of had that, bought a bunch, lost our ass, got it back going again, you know? Exact same. And so bought, bought a few condos, townhomes from from the auction, you know, $100,000 assets. Did you go to the auction yourself and do it? Uh, no, had a good friend that was there. He'd, he'd be on his Bluetooth, you know, earpiece. And let me just call him like, hey, man, 120 grand condo, somewhere in American Fork, do you want to do it? <laughs> like, I don't know, man, do you think it's a good one? He's like, yeah, it looks pretty good. Yeah, the auctions are fun, but they're crazy. I mean, because we, we used to run a company. We'd go every day to the auction. And if you haven't been in the house, you're buying it as is, and you you give them a check that day for anywhere from five to twenty thousand dollars, depends on the auction house, and it's non-refundable. So if you make a mistake and you buy something that's in a lot worse shape, so we would have a crew go break into all the foreclosures or go check them out at least through the windows before we would buy them. But it was the wild west, man. I'm, you're going up against some dudes with some deep pockets sometimes, and but it was fun. It was, and and it, I've heard they don't appreciate new people showing up. Oh, to dude, the auction, let me tell you, right? The first time I ever went. I actually left my first brokerage I ever signed up for. Um, this guy by the name, well, this guy named Brad. But anyway, he uh, I was in his office, and I, my brother and I were going to flip a home. I identified this house I wanted, found it was going to the foreclosure auction. And he had two partners. They were buying foreclosures all the time. But I specifically asked him about this one because he was going. He was going like once a week to the auctions, and they really liked the house. Well, I was going to buy it for like 105 and I'm there bidding with my brother, Matt. We were going to buy it. Like, we were going to go up to 110 maybe, you know? And I think it started at 98000 or something. And we bid it. And all of a sudden, his partners are bidding against me. These are the guys in the office next to me. And I'm, like, looking at him, like, what the hell's going on? Like, and they just kept bidding. And they ended up bidding me up to, like, 120 And then they took it for, like, 122 I was so mad because I knew the renter and I was going to keep the renter in there. Like, I had this whole thing 
planned out. It was just me and them bidding. And I literally was the day I decided I was going to switch brokerages. That's how I switched after being at that brokerage because I was so pissed that they like, they just didn't have my back at all. But dude, it was competitive. They, and they told me later, they're like, look, dude, this is your first time being here. We don't like new people. Like, <laughs> I'm like, I have office next to you. I taught you how to use the damn video <laughs> stuff. I'm like, what the hell? But anyway, it's crazy there. No, I, I, I've never been there in person, but I've heard it's the Wild West for sure. And so from there, I, so I, I bought my own primary home. And um, and then what I, all I was doing at that time was, so I bought a few townhomes condos from the, the auction, right? And I got a really good price point on those. And I was kind of happy for a little while there, satisfied. And then with my primary home, I learned about the fact that you can, and for those that maybe don't know this, I want to share this as maybe a little, little nugget, but you can live in a primary home for two years and then rent it out for a few years. And as long as you lived in the home for two years within the last five-year period, That's right. you can sell the home and it's 100% tax, all the appreciation is 100% tax-free, not deferred tax-free. It's a huge, huge tax benefit, right? A lot of people don't know about that. I'm surprised right. some people don't know about this. Yeah. And so what I've, I've always done with my primary home is live in it at least two years, rent it for two to two and a half years, list it, sell it, and then you take 100% of that tax-free, right? Yeah. Um, but on the investment side of it, uh, you know, I eventually started moving to fourplexes. I love that asset type for a lot of reasons. You know, you get residential financing on it but you get four streams of income from one asset, right? Did you Plus, buy older stuff or did you buy newer stuff? Um, so I was actively, you know, fully engaged with my my, my leadership uh, career at Vivint. And so I didn't have time to really manage it myself or yeah. do the value add. And so it was always buying brand new, new construction, new development. Mm -hmm. uh, all of my fourplexes have been that way. And so, um, but I've loved fourplexes. I think it's such a fantastic investment vehicle for so many reasons. And so what I eventually did was I, I, I sold those townhomes and condos that now have appreciated to you know, a quarter million dollars, basically doubled in value. Uh, and then I would, I would 1031 exchange those into fourplexes. And so I've done nine of those in the last uh, year and a half or so. And it's a great way to be able to go from an equity play of one door into four doors with no additional cash out of pocket, it's just a 1031 with that equity, right? Yeah. And so that's been a really powerful way to kind of build the portfolio. and. You know, you can only have 10 property mortgages in your own personal name. And so it's been a kind of a juggling act of how to have all these fourplexes. And so what I've been doing over the last couple of years is then 1031 exchanging those into apartments because that's a commercial loan. So it doesn't use one of your 10 you know, mortgage spots. Yeah. And a commercial loan for those listening, how much is it up to your interest rate? What is it usually per property? Maybe one point, one and a half? Yeah, it's usually about at one point. But when you get into the really, really big stuff, for example, we just closed on a 237 unit apartment complex in Kansas City two months ago, and that was a 2.8% fixed rate for 35 years through HUD, which is fan um, incredible, right? So 2.8% yeah, fixed for 35 years, can't Crazy. go up. Yeah. And so on that note, like, that's why I'm excited. I feel really worried about inflation, and that's one of the big benefits to owning real estate and hard assets is with inflation. So you know, when inflation happens, you know, market appreciation, you know, asset prices usually go up. And then also rental rates go up as well with inflation. Whereas if you own an asset and your interest is fixed on a 30, 35 year term, you know, so for example, on our asset in Kansas City, it's a $15,000-ish uh, monthly payment. That payment is gonna be the same for 35 years, whereas the asset price is going up and market rents are going up along the way, which increases your NOI, your net operating income. I'm really excited about that. So, but in terms of strategy, 1031s, if you guys don't know what that is, definitely research that. Really powerful. I know the new administration. Who helped will, you to do yours? Did your accountant just help you do your 1031s? Um, or did you go to a company that specializes no, in that? I, it's actually my title company. Uh, her name's Karen. She's awesome. She's been really good to work with. So, But, you know, a lot of this stuff, people are like, well, how would you learn a lot of this? And I just say, you know, humbly that a lot of times it's just about – you know, we live in an amazing age where everything's available at our fingertips. You can see any a podcast, right? This mm -hmm. podcast, you can go, you can search for it. Literally everything's at our fingertips. They say that the, the amount of knowledge in on earth is doubling every 18 months. That's a crazy stat, it right? Is, yeah. And so there's really no excuse not to be able to learn. You just have to prioritize it. Yeah, so the, I guess the disadvantage of that I always say is when, when I was younger and I was trying to study how to, I don't know, get better at life, I guess you could say, one of the advantages that I had was there was only so much material you had. There was basically audiobooks. They didn't have YouTube. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have podcasting. And so I just went and I had, yeah, I had Earl Nightingale, Jim Rohn, and Tony Robbins, and Robert Kiyosaki. And I freaking just listened to those CDs over and over. And honestly, to this day, that's still probably the best stuff that's out there. And so 
one of the disadvantages people have is there's so much noise and there's so many things you can listen to. I think it gets lost a little bit. Like you said, there's so much information every day. There's more information created today than from the beginning of time to 1985, right? I mean, literally. And so I think it, that's one of the issues that a lot of people have. And so it is important to kind of find who is actually having success. That's on this podcast, I only put people that are really having success. I mean, I'm gonna, we're gonna break through the stores. We're gonna see and like the fact that, you know, you own over a thousand doors now, obviously, you're doing a lot of things. You're not just talking about doing things. And and so, 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 so what's the best way you found to be able to get through that noise? How do you figure out what you want to, yeah, you gotta get, you gotta get very clear on who's like, what kind of life you want to be living? Like, who do you want to emulate after vet people out? So there's so many people that talk about what they're doing with real estate or with investing and everything. I say, Hey, show me your portfolio. Like, I remember I have these property or these, uh, uh, funny, like these money finance guys, money managers, right? And they'll come to me. I remember when I was younger and they'd say, Hey, I want to manage your money. Or like, I'll get hit up all the time. Even now and I said, well, show me your portfolio. Like, let me see what you've done. I want to see how much money you're making. And if they won't show me, this is a, it's a dead conversation. Like one of the things that I've done really well in real estate is I'm buying real estate all the time. So when I buy something, my clients know like, Hey, I, I don't have time to vet all this, but I know Jimmy's buying it for himself. Like if I can get the same thing he's getting at the same price, you know, it seems to make sense that I should do it. And so I always say real estate agents in particular, if you're trying to find a great agent, you need to find one that's building their own portfolio. Like if I was going to enter a fund, I'd want to make sure that guy's buying his own stuff, right? Like, like you guys are. And so I think that's the best way to do Cause so many people talk about the money they're making or the financing they're doing, all these different things. And I truly want to see like, Hey, show me your numbers. Show me exactly what you're doing, how long you've been doing it. Um, all the mistakes I made in life when I invested with people, it was taking a chance on somebody, right? It was trying to invest in somebody's new startup or company that sounded awesome. Cause honestly, when you're younger, every investment sounds good. Every investment you get pitched sounds like a great deal because you haven't heard enough pitches to know what a bad one sounds like. And so what I didn't do very well, all the times I lost money is I didn't vet those out very well. I didn't look close enough to see oh, you know what? This person actually doesn't have a track record. It's so difficult to take something from like scratch to get it to where you're actually getting paid out as an investor that even if the company has success three out of four times, you're not going to get paid. And so anyway, I just think that it's really important to look at track record of the people that are doing it. I love that. So one thing that um, my, my boss, you know, mentor for a long time over at Vivint, Todd Peterson, I always should say was that, hey, Dave, whenever you start a new venture, you're going to a new space, you want to identify the top one to two percent of the people in that space and then try to get as much proximity as you can to those individuals. Right. That's great. Either partner with them, JV with them, or at least have proximity because it really is proximity. There's power in proximity. Right. And I really believe that, man. When I look at I know when I was a young kid, I always thought, hey, if I can make 100 grand in a year, like that would be my definition of having made it in business. Right. And it's just great that you hang out with guys where, you know, their paradigm, their perspective on life is so much bigger mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's super inspirational. Cause look at the guy, I'm like, okay, yeah, this guy's impressive, but I can do that. Like, so seeing somebody and being close to somebody that's doing things on a really big level is actually been really, I'm really grateful in my life to have proximity to people like that. And the same thing in my syndication business and with my real estate uh, strategist and a lot of the people that I really look up to and I do business with it, a lot of times it's, it's not so much because it's, I just want to learn from them. So I'll actually do business and invest with a lot of people and a lot of big operators and syndicators and fund managers simply because I want to be close to them to be able to learn how they're doing what they're doing and to tap into their, um, their tribe, like their own, you know, their own ecosystem. And a lot of times there's real value creation there. But going, well, I want to yeah. piggyback on that just a little bit because one of the things that I've done, so people, one of the number one questions I get asked is how I built my network, right? And you mentioned something there. One of the number one things I've done is I'll invest in people, not necessarily in an idea. And one of the reasons I invest in people is because I want to be around those people. So there's a fund right now that I've, I'm an investor in. It's a food and beverage fund. And I invested in that fund because I wanted to get to know the two guys that are running it, Andrew Smith and Greg Warnock. Um, you know, those two are two of the most successful businessmen in the state of Utah. Well, now I help Andrew buy his real estate. I'm helping Greg. We went into Lake Powell together this year. Like I'm, I'm getting around these guys and I sit there and I have hour long conversations with them. And in an hour, I'll learn more from Andrew or Greg than it would have taken me six months hanging out with my buddies that, you know, maybe from when we were back in the day or whatever, and, you know, just shit, shooting the shit or whatever you might be doing. And so you have to be able to get near those people with the proximity like you talked about to be able to suck that information out and use it to your advantage. 
Another example may be your sports card uh, business. You're opening up in Salt Lake, right? Yep. That's mainly from networking events. We've been hanging out with some guys from California, Dan, especially, right? And now you're able to actually do that, jump into that space. You're now a sports card owner as well and a business owner, right? Because that ecosystem that you've been tapping into, right? So yeah, really, well, I because of my relationship with Dan, I, I seeked out the number one guy in the country, that uh, a guy named Jeff Wilson is running all these apps and different things that shows that he's really changing and making it tech and data driven the sports card industry. He's the guy behind all this. I was able to reach out to him and get him on my podcast and spend an hour talking to him, then an hour on the podcast with him because of that relationship with Dan. And so it's like the more you around those people, you just then you then are qualified to meet other people left and right as well. I love that. I want to go back. You you talked about, you know, that the comment about there's so much noise and like how do you pick out what you want to be investing in and where you want to learn from. Mm -hmm. I just want to share a few things real quick. One is in terms of investments I've learned that the higher the emotion, the lower the intelligence, mm -hmm. right? So if you ever feel really emotional about it, a, an investment opportunity or FOMO, fear of missing out, like you probably just shouldn't do it, okay? <laughs> yeah. So the higher the, inte the higher the emotion, the lower the intelligence. Well, it's, it's so hard in that moment to realize that's what's going on because all the bad moves I made, it was the same thing. It was high emotion. You don't want to be left out. You don't want to, you're fearful like that. Like there's, once you learn there's always another deal, you don't, you no longer get that FOMO, but the first five or six deals that got brought to me, dude, I lost my ass on like five or six deals in a row because I had so much emotion around it, right? It was so much hype. And it was like, if you don't do it, it's like, well, everyone's getting rich, but me, the next thing you know, everybody you know, else is doing you're it. You're invested you in know. a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> <laughs> we can share some stories on that. We'll come back. That's round two. We'll dude, go back sounds to that good. Cause yeah, but, I'm sure but, we both did it. But, but I also want to mention that, you know, my best advice to my friends and my capital partners is always, Hey, you really want to get crystal clear on your what your outcomes are like mm -hmm. what what do you really why are you investing in the first place like what you know and, and hopefully we have some time to talk about what i call lifestyle design which is something that i've designed over the last 12 years and it's getting super clear on what do you want in your life how do you define success what's your definition of a meaningful fulfilling you know significant life and one of those those you know chapters in my lifestyle design is financial freedom and so for me personally because i get a lot of deal flow i probably get one to eight different deals in my inbox every single day. People wanting to partner, invest in different opportunities. I just had lunch with one of the guys that you know really well. Um, he pitched me on a, you know, on a, on a manufactured home uh, fund, right? But I, I'm to a point where I can look at a deal and I can literally within one minute say, okay, this resonates and aligns with what I want in my life or not. And so personally, I have a, I have a 10 step guiding principle uh, process to doing my own underwriting. So I can look at a deal and I say, okay, do I, do I trust the leadership team? Uh, what's my risk of loss? What's the tax benefits? What's the liquidity? How long is the, the investment for? Do I understand the investment front and forward? Um, does it align with my, my asset allocation percentages, these buckets? Does it align with my, my life's purpose? Is it something I'm proud of with my kids, right? So I have like those 10 kind of touch points or guiding principles to measure any investment. So that level of clarity and guys hear that sometimes like, man, that's kind of like Dave's geeking out on like really specific stuff here. To me, that gives me uh, clarity. It gives me the ability to be a lot more bold in my decision making and in which opportunities I do want to go after. Secondly, you know, asset allocation is really important. So for me personally, whatever my net worth is, I want to see, I'll share it with you guys, 2% in cash, 3% in blockchain, cryptocurrencies, 5% in bonds, 10% in stock market, uh, fifteen percent in private equity, so you know venture capital, seed money, whatever, and then I want to be five percent in hard money loans. I do a lot of those with flippers and whatnot, and then twenty-five percent in residential real estate and thirty-five percent in commercial real estate. And so I'm pretty strategic with that because I know all markets move in cycle cycles, right? Mm -hmm. Everything's cyclical, and so if I have balanced diversification across multiple asset types like that, I sleep pretty well knowing that hey. You know, yeah, housing might, might tank. Stock market will probably tank pretty fast here. You know, cryptocurrencies, what if it goes down, right? It's all going to even out in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, there's a book called Money Master the Game by Tony Robbins. And it's interesting because he talks a lot about, you know, outlet, asset allocation, how to protect yourself in up and down markets and everything else. Um, it's fun to kind of get diversified too. I like to be very diversified. Um, I mean, I'm obviously heavier in real estate than anything, but that's my expertise. I feel like I have, you know, the cheat codes to the game basically. Um, but it's fun to be allocated because when I lost everything in 2006, 2007, 
I was pretty much 100% in real estate. And when I lost everything, when I went on my mission, I came back and stock market bubble had burst. I was, all my money was in the stock market. I lost you know, 80% of it. And so I've gone through a couple of those where you're like, and at the time it wasn't that much money, but it was all my money. Like to me it was, you know? And so now I've really learned how to hedge and learned how to do those different things, but still being aggressive. And that's one thing I love about real estate in general is because good market, down market, flat market, it should still be a great asset no matter what if you buy it right because you've got the cash flows, you've got the principal reduction, you have the tax benefits and all the other parts that play into that. And if the asset's down, you just don't sell it at that time. Um, you said a really important thing though that I don't want to pass over is where are you going with this? What are you trying to accomplish? That's the first question that you ask that you tell people. It's me and my real estate partner, Tyler, we do these strategy sessions with every single investor and we sit down and we get crystal clear on what their goals are. Because it's like, if you don't know what your goals are, I didn't when I was younger, I was just throwing money at whatever deal it seemed like somebody told me it was a good deal or whatever deal I found on the MLS. The next thing you know, you got a bunch of weird deals that don't make sense. You don't have enough money to take care of them. And so we really sit down with every single investor and strategize where are you at? Where are you trying to be in a year? We're trying to be in five years, 10 years. And then we say, okay, here's how much money you need to invest. Here's how much, you know, what you might want to look at buying. And by setting up that strategy, they really know where they want to go with it. I think in any part of life, whether it's a relationship with your kids or a spouse, whether it's your financial goals, you've really got to get clear. It's something that you do so well. Like you truly do well. You and I, as well as anybody else I know, have mapped out what we want our lives to look like. And then we just go build that for what we're trying to do. And I, I think that's, a, you know, you talked about those principles you have. Um, you can tell you've done that because of the way you've built your life. Yeah, you simply need to get really clear on what you really want and then reverse engineer that down to a granular level, that's right? right? It's actually really simple. It is. And it's, it's simple, but not easy. It, great, that's awesome. That's, that's, that's perfect. Um, so I'm gonna give you the answer on that, but grab some popcorn because it's kind of a long, long answer, okay? So- what, Long podcast, let's hit it. Let's go. So for me personally, I, you know, as I travel around the country, I managed, uh, you know, 120 something sales teams in 42 different states. And I'd always sit down with my, my, my sales guys and I'm like, hey, you know, I want to do a one on one performance interview. And in that interview, I always ask, hey, so, you know, why are you here? What's your why? What's your holy cause? You know, what are you fighting for? You know, what's your motivation? And guys would always give, they always have a, a quick one liner, right? I want to be wealthy. I want a new sports car. I want a house. I want to get married, whatever, right? But when you dig in a little bit deeper, like, okay, well, what does that mean to you to be, um, you know, to be to be wealthy or to be happy in your life, right? Sometimes guys can give you like one more one-liner, but it gets really fuzzy and really ambiguous really, really fast. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, so you want to have this, you know, this great quality of life. You want to have this new home. Awesome. Like how many bedrooms, what price point, where at, et cetera. And you dive into that stuff and nobody knows what they really, really want in life. You know, I always say, you know, I think most people spend more time planning their annual vacation than they do planning out their life, yeah, which is crazy to dude, me. I actually just made a YouTube video called people spend more time planning their wedding than they do planning their marriage. It's the same principle. Hey, there you right? go. It's like the same thing. Like they, they plan a vacation, spend more time on that than they would to plan their life. And unfortunately, like that's the result they get. Which is really unfortunate because, you know, it's like jumping on a boat and you're going to cross the ocean try to get to some other you know city on another continent and just kind of point the boat in the right direction and go versus having gps where you can make course corrections along the way because ultimately in life you know where we get to in life is just a culmination a culmination of all the decisions we made along the way that really is where we end up in our lives right and so if we can make better decisions and course corrections along the way then we're going to be we're, the probability of hitting our goals is so is statistically so much higher right mm -hmm. and but the, the problem is most people live their lives based on emotion. So it's how do I feel today? And it's being very reactive versus being proactive and being behind the steering wheel with, with the direction they want to head in, right? Kind of like in your book. That's really good. Your book you said that very right? well. And so, um, so I realized that a long time ago, like, okay, a lot of these guys don't really know what they want to do. We're out here doing a job that's extremely hard, knocking doors, mm -hmm. right? There's literally, I can't think of a much more difficult <laughs> job than going cold calling, knocking doors, trying to close a deal. Yeah, four hours on the doors is 12 in an office. Same day of installation, right? The whole the whole process, and so, um, like, if we're gonna put that type of type of sacrifice, blood, sweat, and tears into earning the income, you know, let's be a responsible steward over that money and make that money work for me. And so, I got really clear, and I, I designed something called the lifestyle design. And I won't take too much time on this, but it's it, it was just a simple one-page spreadsheet to begin with. 
of what I want in my life. It's turned in, evolved into a 10 chapter um, spreadsheet, you know, 10 tabbed uh, do you mind actually diving into that a little bit? Like, get into I, I, details. I, on I'd that. love to. So, let's do it, let's do it. so section. So basically, the idea again is to get super clear and in writing on what you want in your life. You know, a mentor of mine told me when I was a young man. He said, "Dave, a goal that's not written down is a dream." And I really believe that. I mean, if it's just in our mind, then it's hard to hold ourselves accountable, and we're oftentimes we forget about that. You know, motivation is fleeting. So if we just are motivated and we feel good for a little while and we have an idea or an inspiration, but we don't write it down. And, and so by writing it down, I feel like we're able to hold ourselves accountable and we're able to measure the progress. And so it's actually motivating because you see that 1% increase in improvement as you move along. What I love is Tony Robbins talks about this. He's, there's a two parts to it for me. It's one is writing it down because then it's like, okay, I'm making a statement on this. The second thing is taking the first action towards it. So if I say I'm going to lose weight this year, like when I had a goal, I was going to be 8% body fat on my 40th birthday this year. The next thing I did in that moment was I jumped online and I bought a Peloton because you take one action in that moment that propels you forward because then the universe goes, oh, he's serious. And it starts to conspire in your favor to make things happen. And so, like, no matter what the goal is, as soon as you write it down, the second part of that that I would just say is, is take one action. Maybe it's smaller. Maybe it's getting a gym membership, right? Or maybe it's literally throwing away junk food out of your house. I don't know. Like, I'm just giving an example for something like this. But taking some action in that moment, not tomorrow, not in a week, not I'm starting on July, January 1st. In that moment, you take an action and you let the world know I'm serious about this goal. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a nugget right there. For me, for me, I've, I've taken it where, okay, if I have an idea <clears throat> and it's important to me, I write it down. My next step is to identify a habit that will help me get that. For example, mm. we were in uh, the Bahamas at the Atlantis Resort with my kids for New Year's this last year, and all the kids wrote down their five New Year's goals, right? Love that. And then what we did, though, is the next step was, okay, so what are three habits that you need to do on a daily basis to make sure that you're going to get the outcome that you want in 2021? Because again, I think motivation is fleeting, but habits are what create long-term change. And so I just encourage, you know, everybody listens to this podcast is get clear, write down your goals, but then create the habits to help you, you know, stay on track to get the outcome that you wanted to. And one last, there's a statistic and they say 67% of all stats are made up on the spot, <laughs> but it says 42%, we're 42% more likely to hit a goal simply by writing it down. Yeah. No, no, I think it's probably higher than that. Um, what I was going to say is I love that you had your kids focus on the habits. Uh, I heard a question the other day. It was like, all right, what is the goal you're trying to accomplish in your life? And now name the habit that you have that prevents you from getting that goal. And then you go after that bad habit. It was quite fascinating. Like if I have a habit to have this level of success in work, but I have a bad habit of falling asleep watching movies with my phone in my bed, or I don't get up on time because I'm tired from watching staying or whatever. Like what's that habit that's destroying you? Is it surfing the internet for an hour and a half a night instead of reading? Is it, you know what I mean? And so it was really cool. Is it, is it the morning donut and energy drink or something that used to be mine kept me from my fitness goals. And it's like, as you identify, okay, that's the habit that's really screwing me over. You then go after that habit to change it. Love that. And so as an example, so on the, these 10 chapters, so number one is the end goal. Like what's my mission statement for my life? I know you have a really cool one that you come up with, Jimmy. I, I do. Maybe you can go over that as well. But yeah. and then number two. What's, what's your mission statement? I'd love to hear yours. So mine's actually, it's two chap, it's two paragraphs. It's okay. pretty long. Um, might take too much time to go through all that. But basically it's to, you know, it's not nearly as articulate as what you've got in one, you know, one sentence. But, you know, I want to create a phenomenal quality of life for my family, for my children, give them the opportunities and that all the opportunities life has to offer. I want to be the superhero to my children. I want to be the friend that will give his shirt off of his back to his friends. I want to be the guy that always gives more value than he takes. And I want to make sure that at the end of the day, when I look back at my life, that I personally was able to create value for at least 10 million people and help a thousand people become millionaires. Mm -hmm. And ultimately just be able to be, uh, you know, live a life that I feel was, uh, was worthwhile and a legacy to help my family up level the standards for our family in the future. Uh, and that's just kind of a, a synopsis of it. You know, it's actually two paragraphs long. I love awesome. to share that. In fact, this whole lifestyle design, it's a very personal thing. I never meant to share it with anybody, but I have shared it with a few friends and family in the last few months, and I've gotten really good you know, feedback from it. If anybody wanted a template of it, I'm happy to, um, if they want to send me a, a, a DM on Instagram or whatever, Dave yeah, Allred. What's your Instagram? Just Dave Allred, 
uh, all reds, A L L R A D. Happy to share that. But uh, so chapter one is the is the end goal. Chapter two is uh, is family. And then it's health. Then it's time. And then it's uh, personal development, spiritual relationships, experiences, and personal growth. And so I have these ten different sections and. In each one of those, we've gotten really, really clear, like, okay, what exactly do I want in my relationships? What exactly do I want with my wife? What exactly do I want with my children? My time, I have it all dialed in, like, on a percentage basis, how much time I want to be spending on each one of those categories each week. And then on the the main chapter, chapter number one. you've actually identified, sorry to cut you off, but you've identified how much time you want to spend with each group and with all the different things. I have. I wish I had it here. I could show it to you, man. It's awesome, uh, man. It's pretty detailed. Some people see that, like, man, that's way too detailed. And that's fine. That's just how my that's how it no, works but for me. The the devil's in the details. Like you know, one of the things that I tell people is so I did a I spoke to a summer sales company last week. In fact, uh, this company called Grit, amazing company, leadership. They're all young hustlers. They're young, hungry kids. It was actually a really fun uh, group to be able to speak to. And I told them all at the end of it, I, you know, because I talked about it was about goal setting, and I told them about you know the number one thing that you need to do in goal setting is have an idea of if everything goes right in your life for the next five years, what does your life look like? Like you really have to know what a perfect life looks like in order to go after achieving it was the point of the the whole speak uh, speaking gig. And I told them all, I said, if you send me your five-year goals, I'll give you a free copy of my book. And because a bunch of them, you know, I wanted a copy of the book. And so I ended up getting s- several dozen people sent this to me. And some of them were super detailed, but other ones were so vague. And it was like, I wanted to just reach back out, and, you know, and I didn't have time to email everybody. I said, hey, put the effort into this. Like, I understand that you did this probably to get the free book, but at the end of the day, I just gave you an assignment that would change your entire life. Would take you, if you spent one full day on it, like six or eight hours, it would change the next six to eight years more than anything else you could possibly do. Like really sit down. Like I literally go to another, I love that you had your kids in the Bahamas and you did it there. I went to Cabo this year for two days by myself just to get enough space and clarity and mind strength to design my entire year what I was going to go about doing. And so you really want to design this. You really can't, you, the details matter, I guess, is what I'm saying. The more detailed you can get, it's gonna be so much easier for it to happen, so much more clear what you're supposed to do. And when decisions come up, they either fit your detail or they don't. And it's a lot easier to get what you want that way. I think the, the key there is clarity, right? It's like getting really clear in your mind where you can envision it. So you know, as an example, kind of a fun story, in 2010, my wife and I put a list of 25 things we wanted in our dream home, right? Like, you know, we wanted a trampoline inside and outside. We wanted to have a foam pit. We wanted to have a rock climbing wall, a, you know, a jumping area. We wanted to have a basketball court. We wanted to have a pool, hot tub. We wanted to have, you know, play area, big backyard. Your fire pit, bro. Fire pit. Your fire pit cost me $13,000 because I went to the Prada homes. I went through your home. And I tried to copy it in my home, but the guy had never done a fire pit like that before. It ended up costing me thirteen <laughs> grand. I can't even use the damn thing because I'm so bugged at how much I spent on it. But <laughs> it's beautiful. And yours even has electricity. Mine doesn't. <laughs> uh, sorry to cut sorry, you off, yeah. but the damn fire pit in your house. But you did but, design your house is like amazingly gorgeous. I love it. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. But my where I was going with that is that was in 2010, right? And then that was in a Dropbox folder. And then I, I misplaced that. I forgot about that. In 2016, we designed our home. 2017, we built our home. And then I ran into that, um, that, 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 that document last year. And it was crazy to see those 25 things. And we'd gotten like 23 or 24 of the 25 okay. built in. But it was because we'd, we'd planted that seed, right? Like we envisioned exactly, okay, what exactly do I want the experience to be for my children in our home? But it was so detailed, I could like see, I could smell it. It's like really, really it meant something to me. I feel like when we talk about goals and you know long-term uh, clarity, you've got to be able to get so detailed you can. F- it creates emotion, right? Mm-hmm. You can, you can. It's meaningful to you, and it, it actually it creates emotion. And when you do that, I think it just, just something special happens. Where as long as you work hard and you put time, and energy, and resources towards that goal. You know, it's, a, it's pretty amazing what we can do as humans. I think a lot of times we underestimate what we can actually do. You know, you, I know you've heard the expression, you know, we always overestimate what we can do in one year, but we underestimate what we can do in a three to five year period. Yeah. I believe that 100 percent, man. Same. Everybody's always like, this year I'm going to do these huge, aud- hairy, audacious goals, right? But you got to give it a little bit of time, mm-hmm. right? Um, but I think the key there is also writing it down. So going back to chapter one, so, you know, chapter one is the end game. And so I have my mission statement, two paragraphs, then I have my own personal guiding principles, uh, 10 of those. Then I have my own uh, eight core values. And then I have my non-negotiables, which mm-hmm. I love. 
right? And these are things I will not do in my life, like, you know, put money over friendships or not put my family first, etc. And then the last one is I have um, my eulogy. So I actually wrote my own eulogy for my life, right? I got this concept from the book from Clayton Christensen, How Will You Measure Your Life? Mm -hmm. Phenomenal book. But, you know, if you're having a hard time figuring out what you're really about at, at your core, you know, figure out what you want people to say about your, your legacy, right? Your family, your friends, your neighbors, your kids. What do you want them to say about your life? And that really gets you deep. Yeah, I had a life coach had me do the same exercise, but he had me write the talks that would be given at my funeral by one of my kids, by my spouse, and by like my parent, right? And it was like, if you died in 30 or 40 years, well, you know, what would your what would you want them to say? And then what would they say about you of who you are today? And it was really powerful. It was six different speeches I had to write out, you know, but it was very powerful. And because it really makes you like, you, for whatever reason, it gets you really emotional about it, realizing like, okay, like, how do I want to leave a legacy? Because ultimately, you know, nobody attaches a U-Haul to the hearse. Like, you're not taking any of that shit with you. Like, <laughs> who did you impact? Like, what kind of legacy did you leave is really what matters. So bringing it back to, to real estate specifically, um, you know, w one of those chapters is, is, is financial freedom. And I learned a long time ago, Jimmy, and I think you're the same way, man. Like I, at the, at my core, one of the things that really motivates me is, is having freedom in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, it fires me up and motivates me. And I, you know, it's freedom to not just to, 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 it's freedom to be doing what I want to be doing, where I want to be doing it with people I want to be doing it with. And that's meaningful, purposeful work. And so about I, I can't imagine a life without choice, like without being able to decide where I'm going, when I'm going, who I'm doing it with and what we're doing. You know what I mean? Like that ultimately is the gift of life. Like how shitty would it be to not have any choices? Like you have to hang out with people because you have no one better to hang out with or you have to live a certain way because you just flat out can't move out of that place like that to me is the ultimate pain you know yeah. and so i love that dude like it, it really is that freedom is above everything dude it fires me up man i posted something last week on socials it's like you know freedom is the new rich like having freedom of time freedom of of of, of travel free just freedom in your life to be doing what you feel like you should be doing and again that's not so i can be laying on a on a hammock you know on a beach the rest of my life it's so i can be doing what's meaningful and purposeful and what I feel is significant for me and my family, my kids. Well, like for me, like last week I got a buddy called me and this is a dude that I've hung out with once in the last three years, but he called me up. He goes, dude, we're going to Guadalajara. You need to come with us. I just have a feeling you need to be there. He's like, we work at a children's cancer hospital for these kids in Mexico. And I'm like, well, it's like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's like the middle of the week. But I'm like, you know what? I can go. Like, well, let's go give it a whirl. Like, it sounds, you know, like could be an amazing experience. Dude, I was able to just jump on a plane, go down there, and we end up meeting this kid. Uh, you know, I posted this on my Instagram, but this 17, 16, 17-year-old kid, last May, like two months after the pandemic started, he finds out he has cancer. There's this giant tumor between his heart and his lungs, so they can't do anything about it. It's weaved into everything. And uh, kids are probably going to end up dying here in the next couple months. But, dude, this kid, when he was four months into this, started chemo and stuff. His mom takes his two sisters and just disappeared. She couldn't handle the pain of it, the whole thing of it. She's just gone. They haven't heard from her, seen her since. This kid at 16 years old gets abandoned by his mom. His aunt takes him in. She sells everything she has to try to pay for enough treatment to keep him alive as long as possible. The kid is fragile as could be. He's just this skinny version of himself. And we end up meeting this kid. And I've never met a kid with more energy and better energy towards life. He's so grateful for every single thing he has. And again, he's probably got two to three months to live. And anyway, we ended up putting a thing on my Instagram and raised over $10,000 for him and his aunt to help wow. pay. And by, by the way, in Mexico, that covers everything. Like, yeah. and you know, he's able to go buy a couple things that'll entertain him while his last couple months, some gaming system things and stuff like that. He's a big gamer. And it was one of those coolest moments I've had in the last couple of years to be able to like experience this and see this kid. And he's like thanking us on Instagram and calling us his best friends. And it's just such a touching thing. And like, I only got that experience because of the freedom financially and of time that I have because of what I've done in the past for my work. Like I got to experience that amazing thing. I don't say that to be like, look what I did other than well, look what I got to experience. Like yeah. look what I actually got to be a part of and create for this kid who's got months left to live. Like we were able to do something that 
honestly wasn't happening without us. And so it's really cool. And the more you stack those experiences and the more you actually go do those things, the harder you want to work when you're working because you realize the outcome that you can have on this world, the outcome you can have on other people. And Jimmy, I got to give you props on that, man. I've always respected and admired how much you you give back, man. Like, you know, the $100 dinner club, right? That's fan- That's such a cool movement. You've created that basically from nothing, right? That's a, It's a movement that's now benefiting thousands of people and you know operation underground railroad you've always been about giving back and i just want to say like you know it sounds cheesy but i've i also believe that the more you give the more you get and 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 nothing it feels so much better to give than to get something i'm trying to teach my kids that right now at christmas time we're like giving stuff away and whatnot but it's a hard principle for kids to understand but man and I feel like it creates an abundance mentality. When you give other people money freely of your money, it creates an abundance mentality, and naturally money flows more freely to you in return, 10x. Well, the scientific way I explain that is, I tell people, I say, when you tell the world, like, so whatever you want more of, give it away, that's an old saying. And the reason why is because when I give away money, I'm telling the universe, I don't think this is scarce. I'm willing to give it all away. Like, I gave money when I didn't have any. I gave it when I had it. So it doesn't matter. Like. But when you give it away freely, you realize like, oh, there's plenty of this. So all of a sudden you get to have an abundance mindset around money. And dude, here's the thing that I think is funny is like, I don't understand why more people aren't doing this. Like I truly, it baffles me. I'm like, go do some things like this. You'll see how good it feels. The reward is mine. Selfishly, it makes my life really awesome to live. Like I get the benefit more than anybody. Like I know I'm benefiting those other people, but I get the gift of like feeling that and experiencing that. And I truly, I was telling somebody the other day, I'm like, I don't know why everyone's not like this. I don't get it. Like athletes, for example, they have so much money and they have so much opportunity because they have so much influence. I'm like, just go and do good with it. Like there's so many ways you can give back and do these things. People always be like, dude, you're so generous with this. I'm like, I'm selfish. I just want to have the experience <laughs> of feeling so good when I do it. And I, I love the idea that I can go and help somebody. I know how that makes my life better and how it inspires other people. So it's just like, I just literally drives me nuts. I'm like, I don't know why everyone's not like this. I really don't get it. Like, and it's it, call it whatever, but for me, the gift of life is to have those experiences. And I stack them weekly and daily, dude. And it's just a cool, if nothing else, it's a fun way to live. That's awesome, man. So people are like, why are you you're so giving? You're like, no, I'm actually being selfish because it feels so good to <laughs> yeah, give other like, people. This makes my life awesome. Yeah, that's awesome, man. That's so good. <laughs> Love that. Um, and, and so going back to the, the freedom, you know, how important that was. I know that really resonates with you, Jimmy, as well. So what I did when I was um, when I was younger, I think it was 30 years old, and I said, okay, you know, so I want to have financial freedom. And and before we talk about the real estate side of it, the reason why I think it's important to understand that money is just an enabler it's a facilitator it's not good or bad it really just it just facilitates whatever you're about right if you have bad vices and you love power and control and maybe it's gonna maybe it's not healthy for you right but if it's if you're about giving back and creating businesses and helping other people and travel and experiences and relationships then it's gonna be an amazing tool to have yeah, it right it makes you more what you have right it, it just magnifies kind of who you are right yeah. your core and so um but i think that when you when you make money matter right when you make when you tie purpose to money it actually, it's more meaningful and it actually comes to you quicker. So sometimes people are like, Dave, you talk about financial freedom and this game plan and this blueprint, but I don't have money right now. So I'll figure that out later on when I get money. I, I think that's completely backwards, right? So really we got to figure out, okay, what are your outcomes? What do you want in your life? What's your definition of success? And then reverse engineer all of that. If you have a clear blueprint on exactly what you want in your life and how money is going to help facilitate that and then uh, maybe accelerate that, then I found money comes quicker and you're more motivated to make more money because you know there's a purpose behind it. It's going to create more freedom. It's going to create more abundance. It's going to create more uh, travel. It's going to create more special opportunities for your, your children, right? Whatever those things are. And so identify what, what money means to you and how it really is going to benefit you, not just from a net worth perspective, right? Or number of zeros in your bank account. How is it actually going to create real value for you in your life? And if it's a positive beneficial thing that's uh you know it's uplifting i i I believe that money comes money flows comes money is attracted to where it knows it will be taken care of Mm. well no i have one of my favorite quotes that i say is what good does it do to save the earth or save the world if i forget to take stop and take the time to savor in it right like you have to treat yourself all the time you have to do these experiences because what happens 
is, I mean, work gets hard. Work gets really hard. Like work sucks sometimes. It's not easy to go on the doors or cold call for four hours every morning or whatever it might be that you're doing to build a business. And if you don't have these experiences, the thing about actually going and doing it, doing it when you don't have the money or when you do, is you then have the emotion behind it. It's one thing to put it on the dream board. It's one thing to tell people what you wanna do. It's another thing to go and experience it firsthand because you can draw on that emotion that you felt. You can recall it back and that allows you to get the energy needed to push forward through the hard part of your work, whatever that is. So for me, I have to savor in the experiences of life the all that it has to offer. Like I want experience. That's why I travel and go to all these events and go to all these sporting, you know, things and, and, and do all these things with my friends and my family because I, when work gets hard, I'm able to draw on that. And my why is people are always like, what's your why? I'm like, I got like 50 of them, you know? I'm pulling from everywhere because some days are just really shitty and I got to pull from every one of these whys. And so if I stack enough emotional experiences, it's pretty damn easy to pick the phone up and keep working. And so I think for a lot of people that are like, once I have money, I will. It's like, no, 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 go get the experience. Go experience the emotion and you'll be able to draw on that. And then all of a sudden work will mean a lot more and it'll be that much easier to actually accomplish your work goals. I love that. And if we had time, I'd love to compare your bucket list with my bucket list. I've got a four page bucket list. <laughs> and I know I know you are all about living life to the fullest and experiences. Uh, maybe podcast number two, we can come back <laughs> on that good. one. We'll come back That'd to be that awesome. <laughs> but I agree with that, man. I mean, it's, you know, we work hard and we, you know, you make money to work for you and you do all these things. But at the end of the day, you know, as a, a mutual friend of ours, you know, Aaron Wagner always talks about at the end of the day, you look back at your life, there's three things that really matter, right? And it's, it's memories, experiences, and relationships. Mm -hmm. And it, we got to keep that in mind because, uh, you know, I, I think it's important we remember that and how we operate on a daily basis. And so for me, like adventure is a big part of it, right? It goes with freedom. So, you know, hiking Mount Everest, Everest expeditions, um, you know, skydiving eight times, traveling the world. I think I've been to 44 countries. I think you got me beat somehow. I've been to 71. <sighs> it keeps, keeps going up, man. <laughs> I'm um, single though, dude. It's a lot easier to get around. <laughs> but, you know, traveling and just like experiencing life to the fullest, it really is motivating for me to be able to continue to expand and to keep pushing forward in my business because I just really want to experience all life has to offer. You know, and I think that's such, at least for me, that really fires me up, man. I, you know, it's a big world out there and I and not just me, but my family, my friends, I want to be able to do that for my grandkids, my like my, my posterity, we can go on these, you know, trips every year and go experience the, the world internationally. But um, going back to freedom, since we're both such big fans of having freedom in our lives, when I associate real estate to freedom, what I really did is I reverse engineered how much f financial, you know, passive income do I need on an annual basis to be able to create true financial freedom. And so I, I figured out, and, and if you're taking notes on this podcast, you know, this is a, uh, hopefully something that can add value for everybody listening. It's really a simple equation. You say, okay, what is my current cost of living per year? Okay, let's say it's 50 grand. And then you say, okay, well, what, you know, what, what, what's the discretionary spend that I want in my ideal life, right? So maybe it's an extra 25 grand to be able to travel more or, you know, whatever else you want to be doing, getting married, kids. So say it's $75,000, that's your financial freedom number. And from that, the next line on a spreadsheet is simply, what's my current passive income? Let's say it's 25 grand from a condo or townhome or some, or dividend stocks or whatever. And so the remaining number is your financial gap, your, the gap for financial freedom. So in that situation, it's 50 grand, right? And then you, sim so it's all written down, and then you simply say, okay, 50 grand is what I need in passive reoccurring income to have true financial freedom. And then just reverse engineer that. You know, how many doors do I need? Or how many ATMs or self-storage or RV units or whatever it is you're investing in, right? And so for me, when I was 30 years old, I did that exercise, and I realized I need to have 40 rental properties to be able to have true financial freedom. Mm. And so I wrote it down and then I started tracking that, you know, and it took six years. Uh, when I was 36 years old, I hit that goal. And, um, and then I decided to, to, to kind of go big and I increased that goal to a thousand doors by age 40. But, uh, you know, I, I think that it would have been a daunting goal and I probably would have lost motivation if I didn't write it down and track that on a monthly basis. Like, okay, how, how am I doing on this, this goal? You know, and how much, how much capital do I need to earn from basically, you know, going out and knocking on doors to be able to capitalize these these doors, right? But very, very clear and measuring that. And I'm really grateful to have that kind of that structure to operate with because I feel like that really put me in a good spot. Wow. I think somebody listening to this is like, okay, this guy has all this doors and all this money. Like, how the hell did he get so much money to buy so many properties in the first place? 
Um, and so maybe talk about a little bit of like outside of real estate, what were you doing to increase your, I guess, just your income that you were bringing in? Were there other investments that you did or was it all from your door to door work? Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, it's, um, it's really been a, the, 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 the journey has been taking active income to passive income. And so as I was earning good money, you know, from, from that job, I just actively was, you know, budgeting and trying to live, uh, not let my qual- my cost of living go up proportional with my earnings, mm-hmm. which is what I see most people do. Yeah, As- most people make more money. They just they get a little nicer car, a little nicer vacation, a little bigger house, and it just goes up proportionally. And, and they actually get in even a worse spot because yeah. now their cost of living is way up here. And so mm-hmm. if their income dropped, they're actually in a pretty tough spot, right? And so yeah, and they're enslaved by their job. Yeah, and so it was just, hey, you know, I, I you know, I want to make my money, my money work for me. I read the book Richest Man in Babylon and uh, Think and Grow Rich and read those many times. And I was like, hey, you know what? I want to be, it all comes back to purpose, right? So it's, it's making money matter. It's like, okay, I want this. I want so much in my life for my family, my quality of life, my kids. And so there's so much purpose tied to it that I was able, you know, kind of reverse engineer all of that back down to a, a specific game plan and blueprint there. Um, but sorry, your, your question was... Like what other income streams oh. did you have? What else did you invest in to kind of help you um, expedite this to the yeah, point where you yeah, have yeah. a thousand doors now? Yeah, so so I've invested in pretty much everything, man. Cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, food and beverage, self storage, restaurants, uh, you name it, man. Is there anything you'd say to stay away from? That might be a better question. He, here's here's what I would I would say stay away from anything that you don't really understand. Yeah, the richest um, man of Babylon. That's the whole book. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> yeah, you know, you never Warren Buffett says rule number one investing is don't lose your money. Rule number two is don't forget rule number one. Right. So just don't don't lose your money because then it's really one foot forward, two one step forward, two steps backwards. And and so you know one one best practice I would share is I have a spreadsheet of every single investment I've ever done in my life, and it has you know the name of the investment, how much investment went, money went into it what the return on investment was, and then a score next to it, one through 10. And, Dude, I love that. I wish I'd done that. And, and then even better, the, the, the far right column is lessons learned. And so every investment, good or bad, it says, hey, I did a great job on mitigating risk by having him sign a personal guarantee. Or on this one, I really should have gotten, I should have listened to this mentor who told me not to. Whatever it is, some lessons learned from that so that can be a, a more sophisticated and a more intelligent investor. Dude, I'm gonna go start doing that. Forward. I love that. I'll share a temple with you. Please, I, please. I, I, yeah, I know. And I'll share it with my audience. If you guys want, just hit me up. And, and so in terms of other investments, though, not not really. I mean, it's really been real estate, you know, I, I, a little bit of gains and all those those asset types. But in hindsight, if anything, if, if I started all over again, I would have just gone all real estate and not Same. done any stock market, <laughs> anything else. Maybe some cryptocurrency because that's been kind of fun to, you know, just be in if that If I could do it again, space. I'd put it all in Bitcoin in 2011. But other Actually, than I, that... <laughs> That's a fair point. No, it, you're so right, though. It's like if I would have just stayed in my lane, you know, I think about like in and I would have got much better educated on real estate because like I was I would just do what people told me. I just I trusted the wrong people. If I had had the right mentor, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this thing now where I let people partner with me on houses because a my credit's full. I've maxed out the amount of homes I can buy on my own credit. But I think to myself, I'm like, if I had just had somebody like me, no serious, like me and me at 39, if I'd have had that guy when I was 21, 22 to partner on deals with, I would have so much freaking money now because I would have avoided all the problems. I would have avoided all the pitfalls. I mean, I gave away my first couple million dollars and uh, lost on so many deals I didn't know what I was looking for. And you just don't know when you're younger. You just don't, you, know, you don't have enough life experience. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing these partnership deals because it's like, I think to myself, I would have died for something like that had I known it was available when I was that age. And also, you know, one of my principles in life is that who you do business with is who you do life with, just naturally, right? You're doing business, and so as a partner, you're going to be more involved in each other's lives. And so and one thing I've always said about you, Jimmy, is you are very intentional and purposeful in your tribe, right? Like who you do business with are people that you actually respect and you like and you you want to be partnered with them, right? Oh, yeah. And that's a beautiful place to be in in life, in business, where you can blur the line between work and play because you're working with your friends. Right? Yeah, I, I'm very intentional about who I'm doing my work with, whether I'm the consumer or the person that's doing the business on the other side of it, right? And like, um, I probably to overboard sometimes will literally get upset if like, you know, I'm like, God, oh, I want to be in business with my friends. And so I'm like, why don't they want to work with me sometimes or whatever? And me and you had a dust up one time because you just had something you'd already working with. And then I thought about it and I was like, geez, 
I actually love being in business with Dave and I went back and I apologize. Like one thing about me is I make a lot of mistakes. I'm willing to admit that. Um, but I'm always trying to look at my life and, and nobody works harder than me at trying to get their life, their life right. I came back to you and I'm like, dude, you know what? You didn't owe me shit. Like, I'm sorry, man. That was, <laughs> that was a, a mistake by me. And I'm just really sorry. I appreciate your friendship. And um, I felt like we got a lot you know, hopefully got a lot closer after that. I think so. Absolutely. No, I remember that. Well, that was, that was a, <laughs> that was cool of you to come back and be the bigger man on that. So well, no, and it's like you said, though, it's like, it's, you know, who you do business with is who you do life with. So it is important to be in business with people you enjoy being with, you know, ultimately. Yeah. And so with, with the freedom, uh, Carl, to kind of wrap that one up. So, you know, I think it's just really important to get really clear on what you really want and how you define freedom because for everybody it's different. And, you know, uh, you know, and everybody's lifestyle design and their mission statement is going to be actually really, really different from each other. And that's the beauty of it. And so nobody can tell you what that is. Uh, it's for me, it's a living document. It's an evolving document. Every time I have, you know, I go to a conference or I meet somebody or I read a great book and I get a good, you know, something that really resonates with me, I'll go back to my lifestyle design and plug it in there. So it's always changing and evolving as, as I, as I personally grow and evolve. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, man, um, maybe one more thing to kind of share on that note is I, uh, we were talking about this before we started the podcast, you know, I, I really believe in, you've got to always kind of be on the fringe of your comfort zone because that's where personal development comes from. And so I think a lot of guys, they, they think this is kind of crazy of me, but I, 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 I intentionally always try to stay a little bit uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I just made a, um, uh, 10, you know, 10, all red family, 10 guiding principles for my kids. And we made a poster, we're putting it up in like in the kids' bedrooms and stuff so that they know what all red family stands for. And one of those is, uh, is to embrace hard work and to be comfortable being uncomfortable. I love that. And I think nowadays people always want to find the easy, they want to take the easy route, right? The, the, the path of least resistance. But I've found that usually when something's hard or scared, when it scares you, it probably means you should do it, mm-hmm. right? Like, you know, and I've kind of always embraced that and I've actually kind of just done whatever's scary to me. And um, in this point in my life, there's really only three things that still scare me. And it's, uh, it's open water swimming. <laughs> so, I, so I signed up to do the Iron ca- a full Iron Man with the Iron Cowboy. Are you afraid Cowboy. of sharks? What are you afraid of? It, I, I did an Iron, uh, 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 Iron Cowboy uh, racing event two years ago. Yeah. Only 300 meters, which is not very far. <laughs> and I almost died. I had to call the lifeguard. She came over <laughs> on her stand-up paddleboard, you know, because I'm like on my back, like floating, you know. She's like, hey, are you, are you okay? And I just go, no, <laughs> just, you know, stay with me. So she actually like followed me for the remaining 200 meters of this uh, little, little <laughs> this race. 200 meters in. <laughs> and, and so, and then I hired a swim coach and uh, Lifetime Fitness and, and I hired her to teach me. And after two lessons, she's literally like, Dave, I've never seen this before, man. Something's, like you just sink, you know, like you don't, you're not, you shouldn't, you're not a swimmer. <laughs> She's like biologically, physically, something is just you're, wrong on you. <laughs> you're not a swimmer. I love it. And then eventually I'm like, I know, but like, what is this? Like my body fat, is it my, my, you know, my, my bone density? Like, what is it? And she's like, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's like you're fighting psycho- psychologically the water and you seem to like be with the water. I'm like, all right. I don't think that's it. I don't know. Maybe. Probably is it, though. It probably is. <laughs> makes as much sense as you're not a swimmer. I don't know, how to, you're fix, I don't know how to fix that. That's hilarious. So I love that, though. So that's one. So that's one thing. Um, <laughs> two is, like, stand-up comedy. I'm not – that's, like, public speaking and whatnot. And so I'm committed to doing a stand-up comedy show some point this year. I know you've done that before. Yeah, I did it for years. In fact, when you want to do it, let me know. I'll talk to Keith Stubbs. He's been on the podcast. He's the owner of uh, Wise Guys Wise here guys. in Utah, and I'll get you on. Okay. All right. I've got two jokes right now in my notes. You got two jokes? (laughs) (laughs) Got two so far. So I got a lot of work to do. I love it, dude. You know, they have open mics for that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Dude, no, but honestly, like stand up comedy, it scared me every time I went up. Like, and I loved it. And I was pretty good, I thought. Like, they usually laugh, but it still every time scared me to death. There's just something about it's so vulnerable to get up there and time a joke, you know. But, dude, I love that. I'm going to make that happen with you. Oh, no. I feel like I, I put myself on the spot here. Yeah, and then we're going to go swimming after. <laughs> <laughs> and then the third third thing that I, I'm still... We might tell jokes while we're swimming, frankly. This might be what we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm doing like, like my back, my, my back, back Maybe just get a video there. of you swimming and everyone will laugh their ass off. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the, the third thing that, that, um, that, that I'm scared of, you know, I'm nervous about in my life is 
is I've got these three beautiful daughters and just the idea of them dating, you know, as teenagers, it still scares me. Like, I don't know how to manage that should. exactly. <laughs> I know, right? I've got one boy. I know what to say to him. But my three-year-old is just kind of a little, little, little nervous, nerve-wracking. But really, just those three things. You know, besides that, I kind of have done it. Whatever it's been, I've been nervous or scared of, I just I just try to do it. And uh, I'll yeah. tell you this. After being on a thousand first dates in my life, dude, and seeing a lot of women that were put together and ones that weren't, the number one quality that they all share when they're in a good place is they have a father that they respect, honestly, and whatever that means for them, a strong father. And so if that helps put you at ease a little bit, I think you've done a hell of a job there. Hey, thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, it's my no kids father advice, <laughs> but I have dated a lot, so I've at least seen the other side of it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah. But yeah, so just, you know, you want to always be uncomfortable and, and try to do things that are hard. And, you know, I feel like you know, even even in real estate deals, sometimes when there's a, 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 a more difficult opportunity, there's some hair on the deal that's because that's where the real opportunity is going to be, right? You got to put mm-hmm. some more work into it, and so anyway, just always kind of live my, my life that way, where you know I always want to be moving forward. I want to be up leveling, doing bigger deals than yesterday, and and uh, personal progression is where I feel like I'm 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 the happiest, I'm the most fulfilled in my life, and so and same thing in real estate. You know, sometimes it's just like taking down a big deal, a big project. But I'll tell you this, Jimmy, I've learned more in just doing and jumping in the trenches in real estate than I would have ever learned in like a two year, you know, masters in real estate development at Columbia by just jumping in or and a nine month masters in real estate at Arizona State. <laughs> is that is that what you did? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't the only thing I learned is that I didn't want to do real estate development. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You're right though, dude. You you doing it, you did the work. Like you've done the thing. And that's what's really cool about your story is you're never afraid. Like I gave you props. Like I told you when we talked first talked about your fund, and I was like, man, that just scares me to death. Like, you were just gung-ho going for it. I, I respect it. Yeah, you know, and some people are like, well, isn't it scary to or nervous, you know, isn't it difficult to take other people's money into a deal? And my response to that would just be two things. One is if the deal's good enough, right, like if it's a great deal, first of all, the money is actually pretty easy to find for the deal. But I look at it very differently, you know. As long as the underwriting is done well and we know it's a solid opportunity, and it's something that I would invest in personally, which, by the way, I invest personally in every syndication, every deal I've ever done. Yeah. If I ever raise capital, I'm personally putting money in, mm-hmm. so I have skin in the game as well, at risk, real dollars, not just like sweat equity or you know whatever else. And so, um, but I, I I see it differently. I'm like, okay, if I can create an opportunity for my family, my friends, my social network, people I care about, why would I not want them to come in and give it an opportunity to participate in a really cool commercial real estate asset yeah. or in the Axia fund? Like why, why would I, it's actually selfish of me if I don't provide that opportunity to people that I care about. Why go out to just a, some home office or to a, some institutional money to come in and be my capital partner? Yeah. So I look at it differently, right? Yeah. And knock on wood, I've never lost a dollar of investor capital in any of these opportunities. And so, you know, a lot of these guys are really grateful actually for that. And I know you feel the same way when you've helped a ton of people get started in their real estate portfolios. and these Yeah, I mean, models. I literally, you know, I say to myself, I'm like, if they don't use me, they're going to use somebody that's not as good as me or somebody that hasn't done as much work as I have to figure out the market. And so, like, I honestly take it on as a little bit of a responsibility. And it means a lot to me, too. Like, I won't put anybody in a deal I wouldn't put in myself, you know. Um, well, let's kind of wrap it up on this. Um, we've been going a little over an hour here, but what uh, if people want to invest in the fund, where do they find you at? Well, give us a quick pitch on why the Axia Fund is a great place to put your money if you're interested in going into a, a real estate deal. Sure. Um, I keep it simple by saying you can reach out to me at uh, Dave Allred on social media or dave at axiapartners.com. And I'd be happy to continue the conversation. But in a nutshell, you know, I, I think that it's not a matter of, you know, we will have a recession in the future. I think it's going to be a while for Utah. Utah is actually in a, such a strong position right now. But it's not a matter of if, but when. And so, you know, the way that I look at my investments right now is it's all about recession resilience. And it's all about tax shelter. And it's all about cash flow. And in my opinion, the way we've structured the investment thesis behind the Axia Fund is perfect for the environment we're in today. We're only acquiring cash flow positive assets. It's all real estate backed. It's all opportunistic where we're going to go in and create real value through the value add approach. And it's also all tax sheltered. So we do what's called cost segregation with accelerated depreciation. We pass down that cost benefit to our investors as well. And then uh, the markets that we're focused in 
is one of the most important parts, and we're only going to where there's net migration trends. So people are moving from the East Coast, West Coast into Texas, Nash, Tennessee, you know, Idaho, Utah, Arizona, uh, North Carolina. And so, and that's also red states. So there's not a lot of, you know, government intervention with uh, rent moratorium, eviction moratoriums or rent control, et cetera. And so just looking at, you know, the overall risk profile, you know, you call it asymmetric, asymmetrical risk. And so risk adjusted yield, when you look at the profits or the upsides compared to the downside risk, that's really the beauty and the way that I feel like we're approaching this. And there's risks in all investments, obviously, right? And, uh, you know, this fund is only for accredited investors and it's something that, you know, we'd want to actually have a real conversation with anybody before we ever were, you know, asking anybody to invest in the fund. But I love the team. You know, last thing is the team itself. So couldn't be more happy and proud of the team. You know, our fund manager, he's a savant. He's literally the smartest guy I know. And, and uh, anyway, I'm really excited about it. You know, it's gotten great traction. And I'm excited to, you know, this is our first fund of hopefully many funds in the future. We're just getting started here. And we hope we can create a lot of value for a lot of people. That's awesome, man. Well, appreciate you being on, dude. It's fun to catch up and get your whole story and look forward to doing many more deals in the future. And you, in fact, sent me a real estate referral just the other day. I appreciate you, man, and look forward to anybody that hits me up that's looking to invest in a fund. I've been doing my research on, you know, what you guys are doing and talking to Aaron, and I definitely think it's a great opportunity for the right person. So I say props to you, Jimmy, for this podcast. You've always been about creating value for a lot of people, man. I love that. And uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks, my man. Appreciate it.